Susan Jaffe, Artistic Director of American Ballet Theater, or ABT for short. I'm glad we have some time to talk. And since, you know, like Water for Chocolate is having its North American premiere next week, I figured I will start with something that Laura Esquivel, the author of the book, believes, which is she believes firmly that cooking is a wonderful way of telling a story. Obviously, ballet is a wonderful way of telling a story. Are there parallels between telling stories vis-a-vis -vis cooking or vis-a-vis -vis dance? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yes, uh, in a way, because it's the passing down of traditions. It has spirituality connected to it um, and a lot of uh, humanity and emotional value in both cooking and ballet. I would also happen to think that that as somebody who does not dance, and all of my friends will convince you of that if you need verification, but I do know how to cook, and it does seem to me like they both have a lot to, to share in terms of the recipes that help you tell that story, the way you combine things to make those stories palpable and emotional for an audience. Absolutely, and um, just to go into the ballet, and uh, I really do even though you don't need to, but I do recommend people reading the book and you absolutely have to read the synopsis if you don't read the book. Um, the way that Chris has pulled out and magnified things within the story is, is astonishingly beautiful. And uh, you really get a sense of the, the cultural traditions in the story. Uh, and in the in the visualization, the bat or the physicalization of this story, and Chris is a great storyteller, and so all of the acting and scenes are extremely clear in the storytelling, and very exacting within the score and within the steps. So it's it's very clear and concise, and. Um, like I said, he's pulled out some of the most amazing and amplified some of the most amazing parts of the book uh, and, and made this sort of a visual uh, just celebration of, of parts of this story. And, and actually the whole story actually is obviously the whole ballet um, is a visual and emotional celebration of this story. You were only named artistic director of ABT last May, so this work was certainly, you know, commissioned before you rejoined ABT. Yeah. What was your learning curve on getting up to speed on how far like Water for Chocolate had progressed and what what was the work that was remaining so that it could finally have its its world day world premiere, which I guess was only a month after you were named the world premiere. It was at the Royal Ballet in England. That's correct. And um I didn't even arrive in New York until December. So I really wasn't involved. Um, I did get a little bit of onboarding, but not not a whole lot of onboarding as far as the like water for chocolate. I tried to go to London to see it, but my flight was delayed so much. I would have landed in the middle of the second act. <laughs> so I didn't see the performance. Um, but the team, the team from the Royal Ballet and Chris's team have been here for the last eight weeks, I believe. And just, they're so professional and so detailed and so clear. It's been wonderful for me to sort of watch this ballet unfold um, as it's getting taught to our dancers. And then I just came from a run through and it's, it's ready. It's ready to go on stage, it's beautiful. Well, that's terrific. Now, it seems to me that a work like like this, like Water for Chocolate, gives you an opportunity to reach out to people who may think Giselle and Swan Lake are relics of another era, and this is something that's going to feel more contemporary. What are you? What are the priorities and the challenges you face in attracting new audiences, but still at the same time keeping your core supporters, donors, season ticket holders satisfied that they're going to get the ABT that they know and love? That's a great question. Um, so people love the story ballets. That's what ABT is famous for. And, um, you know, our Giselles, our Swan Lakes, 
You know, those are, are very famous because they, uh, and, and over a couple of hundred years, because they speak to our humanity. They speak to our light sides, our dark sides. You know, they're really metaphorically uh, deep and rich for us to come to the theater again and again, to, to live through these stories again. And I think one of the reasons why people come back to Swan Lake and Giselle, et cetera, is because they know them, they know these stories and they they know what's going to happen. They, they know the music and they want to see the artists take them through this journey. So there's a familiarity to it as well as, I mean, even when somebody comes for the first time, um, any of those ballets is a visual, just, you know, explosion of beauty and uh, depth. In bringing new ballets to our public, you know, but you know, when they say in business, if you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards, right? So it's the same in any art form that we must progress forward. And with the newer choreographers of today, the Wieldens, the Rudmanskis, et cetera, our technique has become so complex, dancer's technique, ballet technique. And a lot of it has also sort of um, melded with contemporary, contemporary upper bodies uh, in contemporary ballet. So we're getting a very complex movement. And, um, and so I think a lot of people, especially people who know ballet very well, will look at these new works and say, my goodness, you know, it's amazing where, where we're going, where we've gone, where we've come from. And uh, newer people who have maybe never seen a Swan Lake or Giselle will just be taken by the story. And um, so of course the dance makers today have to be far more prepared then let's say a Kenneth McMillan who did Romeo and Juliet, you know, back in 1965 or something like that, because they had endless amounts of rehearsal time. In especially the United States, we have limited rehearsal time. So that choreographer has to be so prepared when they walk in our studios and there has to be a lot of detail, storyboarding, et cetera, and a whole team ready to uh, make sure that the steps and the, the storytelling is told. So I think that's also lent to the new choreographers' voices um, because they have to do so much before they even get into a studio. Uh, that they're very detailed and very complex in, in choreographic form. Um, and I think that, um, I mean, I really look forward to audiences seeing Like Water for Chocolate. Um, I think that they will be as moved as I am. Every time I'm in the studio, I am just deeply moved by the story. So uh, it's a contemporary of today, you know, ballet with, you know, somewhat older story. It's a 30 years old. Um, I think the movie is 30 years old. Um, so, and the book obviously was longer. So I think people will appreciate it on a deep level. And I think with ballet, oftentimes the more people return to see something, uh, the more they appreciate it, you know, because we're not a, we do not, have verbal um, expression, right? It's physical expression. And so <clears throat> I think for some people, it's not always easy to capture the language at the first viewing. Um, but then when they come back again and again, which is why they're coming back to see Swan Lake and Giselle, et cetera, and Romeo and Juliet, um, they, they, the appreciation deepens um, because they understand it. Right. Which makes sense. I mean, I know people who, you know, are appalled at the idea of going to spend three hours to hear an opera, but they, by the time they go their third or fourth opera, they suddenly start to get what it is. And it seems to me, you know, that dance functions the same way for a lot of audiences. I absolutely agree. Yeah. 
in the conversations that I've had with a lot of people who are artistic directors or in you know the C-suite at performing arts organizations, they've all been talking about what a challenging time it is getting people to return to the theater, mm -hmm. getting people comfortable because they were so comfortable as we were saying before we started you know, filming this, there are a lot of people who are very comfortable, you know, in the confines of their couch and their remote control and everything like that. What do you see as the top priorities that you face as the artistic director working with, you know, management at ABT so that people do want to come back to the theater and to see ABT in motion? Um, well, a couple of things. First, um, did you know that it was sort of a ubiquitous experience across the United States that every nutcracker that was performed was had higher attendance than even, you know, or and and or equal, if not higher attendance than 2019. So before the pandemic. <clears throat> so uh, it was really just so heartwarming to see all of those people at the performances. And you know, I sit in the audience every night and you could really feel the gratitude. It was palpable in the audience. And there was nothing like sitting in an audience with a live orchestra, with the atmosphere of, of the, the audience and the, um, the really close up view of the, the ballet that you're about to see. There's nothing that replicates that. You actually can't fully experience it on a screen, on a flat screen. So the full experience and the emotional experience happens in the theater. Um, and then we had our Coke season, uh, Coke theater season in October, and we did very well there as well. In fact, we did better than a lot of arts organizations in New York City at that time. Um, then we also have to get, uh, so going further into the United States, we just have to and have been, uh, our marketing team has been doing a great job on marketing these, these ballets. Um, I very much believe in education and so educating our audiences about these ballets. And I just saw a couple of, um, of things that they, they are about to put out to the audience. Um, so the more we can give people backgrounds of the stories and backgrounds of the choreographers, et cetera, the more people will have access to that. And then of course, the more you understand something, the more you appreciate it. So we've had to get pretty savvy about all of that. <clears throat> I think a lot of people learned that lesson that live streaming had to be part of their function during the pandemic. I know dancers of all, you know, genres, you know, were creating their own videos and putting them online and, and collaborating with other people as much, I would assume, to stay in shape as it was to develop an audience. Yes. And just to, to do something to do something, you know? Um, and yeah, I think it, it just continued to keep their skills sharpened, you know, while many people were sitting at home. Right now, because of these devices that we all rely on so passionately for every bit of enter for most of our entertainment, I mean, TikTok, Instagram stories, Facebook reels, et cetera, you know, we're talking about short form pieces that, you know, it's some, you know, most platforms won't accept anything longer than a minute. So our, the attention spans seem to be waning a bit. Um, when you try to get somebody to come to see a two and a half hour, three hour ballet performance, you know, and there are certainly shorter ballets, but how do you, how do you capture the imagination of people who think that the best entertainment is wrapped up in a minute? You probably don't, you know, if people, if there are people out there that thinks the best entertainment is happening within a minute, they're probably not going to come to the ballet <clears throat> or anything that's longer than a minute. Um, and, you know, I think again, it's through, you know, getting people, I think one of the biggest problems is that we have so many choices you know, so many more choices than, than we used to. And then of course, our attention span has, has lessened due to the fact that we're interrupted constantly. Um, our phones buzz, it's either an Instagram or it's a, 
it's a Facebook post or it's a, an email or it's a, you know, and, and the phones are constantly buzzing. So our attention spans have actually been programmed um, through, uh, through constant interruption, not to have a longer attention span. So in order to get a, 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 an audience to come, I think your, your stories and your ballets have to be extremely compelling. And uh, so not only with the marketing, but also with reviews and interviews, et cetera. Um, so, and that's as much as we can do, to be honest, uh, if people, um, and luckily we do have an audience that, focuses and likes to be in theaters. Um, and we're not going to capture those who who do not like that, who not, can't focus for very long. So, but for those people that do, uh, the marketing materials certainly help. You spent a good portion of your career dancing with ABT. And other people I know who have been with dance companies have always had their own ideas as dancers, what they wish the company could be, what they wish the company would do the choices the company would make. Now that you're in the position of being able to make those choices, how does your thought process today compare to the perhaps the thoughts that you were having when you were a dancer? Um, well, of course, it's always easy from the outside, you know, to be saying, well, I would do this and I would do that, you know. And um, when you get inside it, you realize it's just not as easy as a simple decision. You know, there are many, many factors that go into, for example, even programming <clears throat> and, um, and you're working with production and you're working with the head of touring and you're working with your executive director and you're working with an entire team uh, to who is trying their best to make your vision come alive. Um, but then you also have to be realistic. How many new pieces can you do? You know, what's your budget limit? What is the limits um, that you can do? So there are many, many factors that go into it. Um, and I guess one of the biggest things that I'm trying to do currently, um, and, and, and it's a very different world now than it was when I was a dancer. Um, Ev almost everything is different, in including um, the mentality of the younger people, the, the dancers that we're coaching. Um, so uh, right now, my, my big focus is really uh, increasing the diversity within the company, increasing diverse voices, choreographic voices, um, and, and women, more women choreographers. So um, I am, and it doesn't mean that I'm not hiring um, male white choreographers, obviously, um, but I have, when we have new opportunities, I try as much as I can to, to widen our voices. And uh, I think it's, um, it's been really great for the dance world to do those things. And so it's, for me, it's an exciting time and uh, so that's certainly going to be around for a while. And um, and then the other parts of, you know, where I'm focused, I'm focused on the school engagement programs, um, how we're doing certain areas of education, marketing for those, those educating our audiences, audience engagement, et cetera. Um, and then in into, um, fundraising, et cetera. So there are other parts of the organization that perhaps I didn't think about when I was a dancer. I only thought of the, what the artistic vision was. Um, but of course that vision encompasses so many more things uh, than just what ballet is going out on a stage. <clears throat> but my first season, which is gonna be the 20, uh, um, fall of 2023 into spring of 2024, which spring and summer, is all my favorite ballets. Not all, but a lot of my favorite ballets. Um, and so uh, for me to bring to bring those back and, and the balance of, of those works um, has been really um, just exciting to curate. 
And uh, now I'm actually looking to, to the 24, 25 season. Cause I we want to try to get ahead of everything and get everything secured. So um, it's been, it's been really exciting for me and, and fun. Yeah. You mentioned in an interview that you did with, with Sarah L. Kaufman at, at the Washington post in May, when your position was announced um, about his desire to revisit Le Corsair and La Bayadere. And I hope I didn't butcher those too badly because I just don't speak French. That's pretty um, good. But about possibly ad adjusting the storylines and details, you know, after research quotes, so that we're really hearing from audience members. Now, I don't normally look at the comments people leave at the end of a story, but I was curious what people said. And there were comments like, just what I don't want, politically correct ballet. Or I'm very leery of taking a social warrior approach to improving ballet. How do you see the challenges you face as navigating that balancing act that accompanies revising classical work and revisiting classic works? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, everything has to be done very thoughtfully. You know, it's not, um, we have to approach it thoughtfully and not with re not reactionary, right? So, um, so for example, with La Bayadere, which is the first one I want to I want to work on, but although that's several years down the road, uh, already started working with the designer and with um, Indian scholars and Hindu scholars, um, and that's just the beginning. And found out that there there's actually not that many adjustments that need to be made to La Bayadere there are adjustments that need to be made to Labayadere, but it's not, we're not going to suddenly put Labayadere in, you know, the eighties in Las Vegas, for example, <laughs> we are going to do Labayadere um, with some adjustments, uh, which are currently seem to be very, very doable and will not really, um, make a huge change to the ballet, but will be more culturally appropriate. And as far as the people who, you know, it's so easy to sit um, behind your screen on your computer and um, make comments like that, but um, those, uh, I don't really pay much attention to it because, you know, they're not incited and, and you know, I feel very responsible for what we put out on stage um, and also responsible to the art form. I am a traditionalist and I want to preserve the traditions of ballet while not uh, misappropriating, while not insulting, but also preserve. And so um, that, is, that is who I am. That's who I always will be. Um, and so you're not going to see, I'm not going to turn the whole world upside down and suddenly everything's going to be in a different, uh, you know, completely changed. It, it won't, but it will be adjusted. Do you find, however, that like labels that we use to traditionally identify things are maybe falling a bit by the wayside and what what was once considered opera is now any number of things. What was considered jazz is now hip hop and and all kinds of other things. Are there is there a is there a sort of a dissolving a little bit of what the term ballet means, or will it always be ballet as you know any of us who are of a certain age grew up seeing? Um. Well, I think there's a very big difference between jazz and hip hop, by the way. But anyway. Um, Huge uh, light years difference, and they're both amazing. Um, it depends upon what people think traditional ballet is. You know, um, I think traditional ballet is not only your Swan Lakes, but your Romeo and Juliet's and Laura Lubavitch's Othello, and you know, it it, it covers a whole uh, array of things and. What I consider to be ballet is when it is balletically based. So like Water for Chocolate is balletically based contemporary movement. Now we're not talking about contemporary dance, but it has a, it's a, a contemporary feeling to it. 
but the legs are classical uh, in their execution. And so for me, it's an exacting, you know, uh, of the of the the, the legs uh, and the technique uh, of ballet that that makes um, something what I would consider to be classical ballet or ballet, maybe not classical, but, but ballet. Fair enough. Um, I've read that you're a strong proponent of meditation, um, yes. which I happen to really like a lot. And so I want to ask you about something that T.S. Eliot wrote, and I'm mm -hmm. going to ask you to bear with me. It's not exactly brief, but I, but it leads to, I think, a good point. He wrote, I said to my soul, be still and wait without hope, for hope would be hope for the wrong thing. Wait without love, for love would be love for the wrong thing. There is yet faith, but the faith and the love are all in the waiting. Wait without, though, for you are not ready for thought. I'm sorry, wait without thought, for you are not ready for thought. So the darkness shall be the light and the stillness the dancing. Where do you find dancing in the stillness and how important will it be for you finding that as you navigate your way through your time as artistic director of ABT? The stillness and the dancing. Um, well, I, you're tying that to, to dancing ballet. I was thinking in thinking that it was dancing of the soul. Um, they both, they both work for the question though. They both work for the question. Um, well, good ballet, just like any good art, comes not from the technical execution of it, but the transformation of that technical execution into depth, authenticity, beauty, humanity. And that's what makes ballet or any art form really difficult, right? But you can't access your authenticity if you don't know who you are, right? So for me, an artist's responsibility is to not only know who they are from the depths of silence, um, but then be looking out, you know, and I think you would know this, you know, when you're meditating, you really get to experience sort of the compassion towards humanity and for all our failures, right? We are a bunch of failures failing up, um, sometimes failing down, but usually it failing up, even if it doesn't look like that. Um, and so, and, and you know that when you're sitting in an audience and you feel and sense and experience those artists that are in the flow, and I mean the flow by being that in a way that you're being danced by a much higher um, energy, right? So you've done all the work, you know, you, you've done everything, but from, from deep within um, is the real art. And that's a dancer's journey, right? You can't do anything on the surface because you will not move your audience and you will not move yourself, right? So from the depths is where it's the origin of the emotional force of dancing. And is it from those same depths that you have to rely to guide your way as artistic director? A hundred percent. Yeah. Because I'm in charge of all these people, <laughs> you know? Um, and that is, uh, that's, I take very seriously. Um, and I want everybody to grow and, you know, you still have to be honest. You still have to, uh, make sure that that everybody is um, growing, but also understanding where they need to grow. Um, and, you know, I think it's a delicate art. Um, leading people is not for the faint of heart. It is, it is uh, a huge responsibility. 
And not only leading people, but also leading us into our um, new artistic vision and endeavors for our audiences. So I take that very seriously. Um, and hopefully not, I'm not taking myself too seriously because uh, that would be tragedy. Um, but um, yes, I do believe that um, deep thought and responsibility goes into these kinds of jobs.